moving on to the last session of the day, I'm delighted to welcome Sam James to present. So I think Patrick mentioned earlier on today the importance of really trying to find areas of unmet need, clinical questions that need better tests. I think lung cancer is absolutely one of those areas that Sam will elaborate on. And also, I think there's a lot that the breath field can learn uh, from other modalities, things like liquid biopsy and other metabolomic type approaches as well that we can adapt into our own studies. So delighted to have Sam with us here today. So Sam is the head of respiratory research at UCL and a respiratory consultant. His research interests in lung cancer, in particular early detection of lung cancer, mesothelioma, and interventional and diagnostic bronchoscopy. After his PhD, Sam worked as a postdoc for CRUK with Fiona Watt on lung cancer biology. He moved to UCL and led a group interested in the role of stem cells in cancer pathogenesis and the treatment of lung diseases using cell therapies. He recently launched a summit study, which he's going to talk about more today, a 12,000 participant London-based study examining CT and blood screening for lung and other cancers. Sam is also the vice chair of the National Clinical Expert Group on lung cancer. So welcome today, Sam, and over to you. Great. Thank you so much for the kind invitation today and um, letting me talk about some of the work we're doing in London. And <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is really a sort of um, mixture of stuff that comes from our laboratory. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some early lung cancer biology. Um, I'm going to sort of discuss lung cancer more generically, um, really showing you what a, what a sort of desperate disease it is, but actually what an exciting disease it is as well in the breakthroughs that we can make. Um, I'm going to give just a little insight into normal airway biology and how we do need to be careful with cancer biomarkers. We could be tricked by normal, normal airways. And then in the last 10, 15 minutes, talk about the summit study. So CT screening and also um, the summit sort of second purpose, which is really testing uh, and validating a blood circulating free tumor DNA biomarker for cancer. So uh, I thought I'd put some conflicts of interest up. Um, so probably worth pointing out uh, is this line here, some, some grant income. So Grail uh, Incorporated fund the summit study. Uh, and actually I've also received some funding for a clinical fellow to help run one of the Alstone Lucid studies in the past. So I thought I'd kick off with the clinical case because this really shows uh, kind of where we were when I started as a lung consultant um, back in 2005. So a 67 year old man, 40 pack year of smoking. So that means he smoked a pack a day for 40 years. Um, he's coughed up a little bit of blood and he's got some weight loss. So already as a clinician, we're thinking the worst. And sure enough, he has his chest X-ray, which shows the classic shadow on the lung um, and a CT scan, which I think you can see here. Um, so this is his left lung. This is the tumor actually here, the little rim around it. And then there's some collapsed lung around it, which sort of makes it look even, even worse. Um, Rather ironically, he came to me saying he had some pain. We we'll often we'll say, what, what, what tablets are you taking for your pain? Uh, and he showed me uh, that he was keeping his painkillers in his tobacco tin. So we discuss these cases. We look at the radiology um, as a team uh, and we staged this chap as T2. So tumor sort of two more than two centimeters. He had some lymph nodes in the middle of his chest, so N2 and M1 means metastatic disease. So he had some uh, bony metastases, which were causing his pain. So the MDT, so the multidisciplinary team decision then was to treat him with chemotherapy. Uh, and he was started on chemotherapy and assessed after four courses. So he gets chemotherapy every three weeks. Uh, and he actually had quite a spectacular response. So he was one of perhaps 40% of people that respond to chemotherapy. So we can see here the tumor shrunk right down and actually the lung around has re-expanded. So it does look much better. Um, however, what happens with lung cancer, of course, is that it comes back. 
Um, and so this is 11 months later, the tumor's back to looking how it was and actually had further spread and sadly died that month, so 11 months later. So why do I say lung cancer is a great sort of place to be working in at the moment? Well, actually we've got lots of new toys as respiratory physicians. We do ultrasound in the chest to try and diagnose and stage lung cancers. We stage lung cancer slightly differently and certainly the pathology we want to know a lot more about. We want to know what type of lung cancer it is. And in particular, if it's an adenocarcinoma, which is by far the most common in the US, it's about equal to squamous cell cancer in the UK, because in adenocarcinoma, these tumors can contain lots of genetic mutations, which we now have, have drugs to target. Um, we're also interested in the immune profiles of these tumors now, because we also have immunotherapies to offer. Now, targeted treatments and immunotherapies are both fantastic, they're major breakthroughs and very exciting, but they're not curative. These are still palliative treatments, so just holding back the cancer. We use different chemotherapies now, and now also actually we use what we call liquid biopsies. So these are blood samples where we're looking for tumor DNA in the blood, and we tend to use this in um, uh, rel the relapse environment. So we might start people on a therapy, for example, an anti-EGFR therapy, um, and then we check their blood if they appear to relapse because they can develop mutations which we can pick up in the blood. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a bit. So lung cancer, yep, yeah, it's the most common cancer killer uh, in the UK. About 100 people a day die of lung cancer. Uh, and the overall survival, you can see 5% after 10 years. Uh, really, really pretty dismal. So here's the CRUK figures. You can see biggest cancer killer, killer of both men and women. So uh, kills more women than breast cancer, although breast cancer is much more common than lung cancer in uh, women. Lung cancer does kill more women. Um, and really, despite the facts we're getting new treatments, we're really making slow inroads. So this is um, five year survival data uh, across three time points, so 1995, 2004, and 2014. And you can see the UK here is lagging behind the other countries that collect similar data. So, so these are the countries that really collect really good uh, cancer mortality data. Um, so our five-year survival is about 15%. You can see perhaps just over 20 in the leading countries. Uh, where we have improved nonetheless, and interestingly, the improvement is all in early stage disease. So here is the 2004 in blue and 2000 in, uh, 2014 in red. Uh, so you can see in the blue circle here, this is the stage one disease. And this means that there's just a tumor in the lung. It hasn't spread anywhere else. Uh, and you can see the uh, survival has increased enormously the one year survival by maybe 12, 13%. Whereas we look down at the stage four disease, so this is the metastatic disease that has spread around the body. Uh, despite the new targeted therapies, uh, this data is probably too early for the immunotherapies, but we see no, no improvement. And this is interesting because this is where the majority of the money goes, both in research and treatment, into these systemic therapies. And yet, while we might be making great difference to a few individuals, we're not making a difference overall. So I'm really interested in squamous cell lung cancer. And I thought I'd describe this story because it's really some detailed biology. I won't go into too much sort of detail, but it really shows that we can ask incredible questions of human samples about the biology, looking for biomarkers of progressive disease. So the normal airway has this uh, pseudostratified epithelium, a beautiful thing, beautifully ciliated. The cilia sort of move the phlegm and debris that we breathe in up into the back of our throats and we swallow it down without noticing. Uh, if you damage your airway, you probably get a squamous metaplasia. This is a sort of slightly thickened epithelium to probably protect your airway. However, if you get genetic mutations, you start to get unusual looking epithelium. So this is mild dysplasia, moderate, severe. And then this is carcinoma in situ. So this to a pathologist looks like cancer, but has not invaded the basement membrane. So the basement membrane is still intact, so it is not an invasive cancer. 
Uh, now, traditionally, it was thought that this was just a precancerous lesion that would progress to squamous cell cancer. So much of uh, what I'm going to show you over the next 10 minutes is a courtesy really of Jeremy George uh, and his brilliant nurse, Bernie Carroll, uh, who set up the UCLH Lung Surveillance Study. And this has been sort of run by a lot of clinical fellows over the years. Um, and basically, we have a cohort of patients that have a normal white light bronchoscopy. So when we look down into their windpipes with a telescope, uh, the airway looks normal. However, when we look with an autofluorescent bronchoscope, so a blue light, we see these lesions. So I think you'll be able to see here a purple lesion. And that is a pre-invasive carcinoma in situ lesion. So hopefully now you've got a video playing of one of these bronchoscopies and we're going down into the left lung and you can just see a sort of pinky orange epithelium. Uh, and this for all the world looks pretty normal. So a really expert bronchoscopist might look at some of these areas and go, oh, I'm just not sure about that. But generally most bronchoscopists would say this looks pretty normal. So now Jeremy, my colleague, is switching on the blue light and he's going back into the same airway. And what I want you to do is look at about 12 o'clock uh, up here. And I think you'll have a sort of, yes, here we go, a purple lesion come into vision. And that's a carcinoma in situ lesion. And then look down here at this carina we looked at before, completely purple and abnormal to the blue light. And these areas are carcinoma in situ lesions, which Jeremy then biopsies and follows over time. So he'll come back in six months and have another look and repeat a biopsy. And what Jeremy found, I think is incredible, and it was really the first observation of this, when he had patients with carcinoma in situ lesions, he found it was actually equipoise whether they progress or not. It's not destined, destiny. So around 50% will progress to a squamous carcinoma over the next three years but around a third regress back to a more normal epithelium and the other 20% appear to be stuck in, in, in a sort of balance with the normal epithelium. So as I said, what Jeremy does is he biopsies these uh, lesions in these patients every six months. Uh, so here we have the first patient and what you can see is eventually after four years, the biopsy showed progression to cancer. Whereas when we look at the second patient, you can see six monthly biopsies. And then after around three and a half years, we have a biopsy showing regression back to a more normal uh, histology. So patient one, we would call progressive and patient two, regressive. And the data I'm going to show you is from what we've called the index biopsy. So the biopsy, carcinoma in situ biopsy, before progression or before regression. And what we should be able to see are the molecular differences, which mean these lesions either progress or regress. And if we can understand those differences, then surely we should be able to uh, perhaps generate therapies that could eventually uh, stop these things progressing. So this is a good opportunity to thank the people that did much of the work in this first analysis. So Henry Le Six was a student in Peter Campbell's lab in the Sanger Institute. Adam Pennegook was a clinical student um, doing a PhD at the time and now a clinical lecturer in uh, my lab. And he did much of the data integration. And then Vitor Texera and Chris Pipinakis worked incredibly hard over a number of year, years collecting these lesions, laser capturing them, doing much of the initial uh, analysis. So what does a carcinoma in situ lesion look like genetically? Well, this is called a circus plot. Uh, and basically it's a design by the Sanger Institute to show you all these dots around the outside are genetic mutations in each of the chromosomes that you can see as a sort of clock face. Uh, and then at the next level, we have insertions and deletions. And then on the inside, we have the, the chromosomal rearrangements. And you can see, so this is a precancerous lesion, carcinoma in situ, it has 34,000 substitutions, uh, 1,800 deletions, insertions, and 182 chromosomal rearrangements. And this really for all the world looks like a full blown invasive cancer. So is there a difference between regressive and progressive lesions? Well, yes, there is. 
progressive lesions do indeed have more genetic damage. So we can see here our progressive lesions have more substitutions, more insertions and deletions, and more gene rearrangements. And one of the things we're often interested in is driver mutations. So these are the mutations in genes that really do appear to cause cancers, drive cancer growth. And interestingly, again, the progressive lesions do indeed have more driver mutations. But look at the regressives. The regressives are interesting. So they on average have one driver mutation each. But look at this uh, regressive lesion here. This had five driver mutations and yet still managed to regress. The genes that are affected are here on the right hand side, the carcinoma in situ, and on the left, we have the full blown lung squamous cell carcinoma. You can see it's all the same genes that are being uh, mutated in these two different types of pathology. This is the copy number. So really, again, in the bottom two thirds, you can see the progressive lesions compared to regressive at the top. Uh, and you can see the amount of chromosomal copy number variation. So this huge amount of damage. And the green arrow points out uh, an area we're really interested in. This is uh, 3Q. Uh, so on th chromosome 3Q, uh, what we see is uh, very frequent, we see amplicons. So 28 out of 29 progressive lesions had amplification of this tiny area. And this might happen without a P53 mutation. So we're really interested in this area. Contains a number of oncogenes um, that we think might be crucial for squamous cell carcinoma progression. How about gene, uh, gene expression? So on the left-hand side, we have regressive versus progressive gene expression. Uh, people that do gene expression work will see this all the time. So you kind of almost expect these things to, to be different and sure enough they are. But look at the methylation. So methylation, the epigenetic regulation of these genes. Again, we have a clear distinct difference between regressive and progressive. But on this occasion, we've also examined normal epithelium and the regressives in green really just distribute within the normal epigenome. So the regressive lesions really appear to have a normal methylation profile. And I think that's really interesting and potentially a really interesting biomarker of progression. So when we've used these things as biomarkers, what we see for both gene expression, methylation and copy number abnormalities is that they all predict pretty well, this was in a validation set, they all predict pretty well whether a lesion will progress or regress. So we're really pretty confident that we know a lot about carcinoma in situ at a molecular level. We can predict lesion outcome pretty accurately using genomic, epigenetic or transcriptomic data. And probably a key is chromosomal instability. This really closely links to progression. But of course, there's growing interest in the immune characteristics of cancer and whether this is targetable. So that's the next question we asked. And we are simple questions. You know, can we see loss of antigenicity? Uh, can we see loss of immunogenicity? And then finally, can we see an immunosuppressive microenvironment? So basically, could any of these things be explaining why some lesions progress to full-blown invasive cancer? Well, I think the first thing that people are interested in is often whether these lesions are being infiltrated by lymphocytes. So it'd be lymphocytes that should be detecting uh, the sort of neoantigens that are made by molecular mutation within a cell. So you'd imagine something that has lots of mutations might have many neoantigens and our immune system should be detecting that and should be eliminating those cells. Uh, and obviously in progressive lesions, you'd say, okay, well, in progressive lesions, clearly the lesion has got around that somehow. And that does seem to be the case. So here in green, we have regressive lesions compared to orange progressive lesions. So we clearly have more lymphocytes in regressive lesions. Uh, and we see that in our gene expression data signatures and our epigenetic data signatures. We asked, is there a sort of pro-inflammatory sort of cytokine milieu within regressive lesions? And again, there is. So here are our regressive compared to progressive with pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, whilst our anti-inflammatory cytokines are equal, giving us a pro-anti-ratio where 
the regressive lesions seem to be very pro-inflammatory, explaining presumably why there's so many lymphocytes in these lesions. So why are, why are progressive lesions progressing? Um, they seem to be keeping T, uh, the lymphocytes out. Um, and why is that? Is that a problem with antigen presentation? Well, it probably is. So this is an incredibly detailed picture, but basically we have lots of genes, 62 genes, that are involved in antigen presentation, antigen processing, and immunomodulation. And what we see is a real devastation of these genes. So we see genomic, we see epigenetic, and transcriptomic aberrations in the genes involved in MHC class one antigen presentation, really suggesting that the progressive lesions are sort of having an implosion of antigen. They just no longer presenting antigen and hence avoiding the immune system sort of new immune surveillance. Interestingly, they also show marked loss of heterozygosity, again, a sort of clue that there's going to be damage in these genes, and promoter hypermethylation, suggesting that the HLA region is also being attacked by epigenetically switching it off. So overall, I think regressive lesions, we know they have increased invasion of CD8, pro-inflammatory cytokine. We did some neoantigen work, and but we didn't see any particular neoantigens that were leading to regression. But overall, it seems that the immune system is working how we would want it to. Whilst in progressive lesions, we see this sort of attack on genetic, epigenetic, transcriptational uh, uh, perturbation of the antigen presenting machinery. And this gives us a sort of double axis of lesion progr progression. One, you need chromosome instability. Secondly, you need, if you have, if you're immune competent, then you still have a good chance of regression. So what are we doing with these patients now? We know that half progress over three years. So what we feel we have to do is to uh, treat them and we're doing them as, in a randomized control trial. We're actually ablating these lesions down, down the airway. So we use a bronchoscope to go down and we use electrocautery and we'll compare this to a surveillance arm. Uh, and the reason why we think this is, is the right thing to do is actually these patients are very prone to developing lung cancers elsewhere. So our sort of record holder is a patient that had seven different lung cancers in different areas. So it might well be that surveillance or just watch and wait is equally as effective in these patients because you might well be having to concentrate on treating lesions elsewhere. So I just want to mention on a few slides some data which I think is astonishing. And this is, uh, I think, really important from the biomarker point of view, because it suggests that biomarkers you look for that you assume are going to be cancer biomarkers may not be. Uh, and so this is work done by Kate Gowers, a postdoc in our lab. And she uh, went along to bronchoscopy and basically our bronchoscopist took normal biopsies from airways. And they took these biopsies from children, uh, non-smokers, ex-smokers and smokers. And Kate brought them back to the lab and she, she digested them down to single cells. She then sorted them into 96 well plates and grew them up as single cell cultures. And when she had enough DNA for the Sanger to sequence uh, the DNA, she then sent them up to Peter Campbell's lab at the Sanger, Sanger Institute where they underwent whole genome sequencing. And this is all the data from, uh, from this uh, work, all on one slide. But to make it easier, let's just concentrate on the top row. So we have a child, three children, four never smokers, six ex-smokers, and three current smokers. And what you can see uh, on the y-axis is the number of uh, mutations. This is the single base pair substitution. So you can see almost no uh, abnormalities in the children's cells. There's one cell which has quite marked abnormality, um, but generally no, no problems. And then in never smokers, we see a raised number of mutations. Ex-smokers and smokers, we see a lot. But what is really striking uh, is the sort of heterogeneity of mutations. Remember, these are single cells from the same airway, from, from a tiny little biopsy. So they're really neighboring cells. So some cells appear to have almost, well, no discernible tobacco-induced mutations, whereas other cells, a neighboring cell, might have 10,000 mutations. 
So looking at this a different way, this, this black line with a sort of blue statistical border around it is the number of mutations that we all get in every cell of our airway uh, over time. So here's our age uh, and you gain about 22 mutations per cell per year in your airways if you're a non-smoker. Uh, and you can see if you're a smoker, you will generate many, many more. What are those mutations? Well, you'll recognize these genes from the genes I presented for lung squamous cell carcinoma and carcinoma in situ. All the same genes are being mutated. And then look over here, we've got current X, never and child, and these are the driver mutations. So what you can see is that some of these cells have, you know, as many as three driver mutations. Uh, but look at the never smokers. We can see driver mutations. We can see two driver mutations in people that have never smoked in their normal airway cells. But what I think is really cool is this, is this way of looking at the data. So this now on the y-axis is the fraction of cells with near normal mutational burden. So we'll look across to the current smokers and you can see between two and 5% of cells in a current smoker's airway have normal, normal mutational burden. So no obvious tobacco damage at all. But look at the ex-smokers. And let's look at this 71 year old, the third column in this, this uh, patient. And what we can see here is more than half of the cells of this ex-smoker's airway show no sign of tobacco damage. So what this suggests to me is that if you stop smoking, you enable these cells with no damage to, to win a sort of clonal war in the airway. And these cells will proliferate and grow back and replace the most damaged cells, thereby protecting you from getting cancer in the future. So could we see a future where we could manipulate the lung, or maybe even other organs, to expand non-mutant cells, thereby reducing cancer incidence? So I hope that's given you a real flavor of the complexity of genetic damage in uh, lung cancer pathogenesis, but also the regenerative capacity of lungs. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about CT screening. So, CT screening for lung cancer saves lives. Um, it's now unchallenged and that came from a large American study, NLST, where there's a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality with CT screening compared to chest x-rays. And this data has been reproduced now in a European study called Nelson. So I got interested in this because I was really keen to try and introduce CET screening into London and into this, particularly the sector I work in. And I knew that the NHS wouldn't be funding this for probably many years, uh, many years. So I thought, well, we should build a research program. And what I was interested in was uptake of screening. So it's all very well having a screening test, but if people don't do it, then there's no point in having it. And in the US, what they found is only four and a half percent of people that qualify for CT screening are actually screened. So that screening program is sort of, you know, it's constantly failing the people that would qualify for it. If we look at how the trials tried to recruit, uh, what you find is that they tended to use direct mailing. So just mailing every household in a district. So that's the American trial, or they might be population based. So again, just doing population surveys, finding age groups and then sending out um, mail. And what they would do is then do risk scores. But look at the enrollment rate, absolutely miserable, incredibly expensive, incredibly hard work to deliver. So in 2013, we uh, developed the lung screen uptake trial. And I did this with a lady called Jane Wardle, who's a sensational um, psychologist uh, that ran public health, particularly screening studies. And sadly, Jane died uh, before lung screen uptake, uh, the uptake trial finished. But her PhD student, Sammy Quaif, who now has her own group, and Monta Ruparel, our clinical PhD uh, student, who also ran some of the LUCID study, um, developed this idea that we could uh, reach people and get a good uptake for CT screening 
if we use their GPs, Jane, Jane Wardle said, Sam, you must ask the GPs to tell these people they have to come for their lung screening. So what we did was we developed the idea of the MOT for your lungs, where you would come up for a lung health check. So none of it is sort of saying you're a smoker, you need to be screened for lung cancer. It was much softer language. Uh, and what we did was we asked GPs to send out the, these test invitational materials. So uh, they're sort of non-threatening, they're not very mathematical. Um, the MOT in England, in the UK, is basically the annual test that you have for your car that will check the brakes and the oil, et cetera, to make sure it's safe. So people really got the idea this was a bit of a lung checkup. And we compared this to control invitational materials, which were, you know, much more mathematical, explaining risks, explaining why the person was being targeted, etc. So what were the results? So actually, the results, I think, were amazing. In fact, for the primary outcome of the study, the study was negative. So here you can see the interventional group that had the lung MOT leaflet compared to the control group. And these are the quintiles, the sort of most deprived quintile of population compared to the least deprived. And you can see for the most deprived, maybe they, they appeared to come up a bit more with the lung MOT compared to the least deprived, but overall there was no difference. However, the key thing is in the title of this slide. So overall recruitment was 53%. And this was with simple letters from the GP asking people to go up to a hospital to have a lung health check. Um, and I think this was really revolutionary for the UK government, who were very worried that maybe there would only be a five or 10 percent uptake of CT screening. So that, you know, we very quickly demonstrated that with no advertising, no public messaging, that uptake could be much better. Were the people coming up that we were really trying to target? Well, yes, they were. So this, these are um, who came up. So this is the leaving school before the age of 16. You could see we targeted those really well. And again, our most deprived quintile also came up to the study. So that rolls us into the summit study, which is probably the, the true reason why I've been asked to, to come today. So summit, uh, the lung screen uptake trial finished. I really wanted to expand out CT screening. Uh, we were looking at ways of trying to fund it locally through sort of different NHS drives. But then I met some investigators from Grail, uh, California based company uh, that were interested in testing their uh, blood biomarker for cancer. So the summit study was a prospective cohort study. Uh, we recruited actually 13,000 high risk individuals. So again, these individuals were 55 to 77 and had a quite heavy smoking history. We were trialing annual versus every other year or biennial CT screening. And the aims of the project were really to test the feasibility of implementing CT screening across uh, sort of quite large, about two fifths of a major European city, uh, that being London. And secondly, evaluate the performance of the multi-cancer blood test that Grail uh, were validating and improving. So this is, of course, no small undertaking. Uh, the UK, uh, for example, has one of the lowest CT scans uh, numbers in, in Europe. So we have uh, nine CT scanners per million population. The average across the whole of Europe is about 29, I think. Uh, so you can see how poorly resourced we are for your imaging. So the first thing we had to do was to buy four new CT scanners and actually build new premises for them because we had to run three to four outpatient rooms per scanner uh, per site. So we built four CT screening units. And the great thing about these units is they were built, funded by Grail, built by us, but they'll be inherited by the National Health Service. Uh, and we built them across the sector so that people wouldn't have to travel too far. So different to parking a mobile unit in, in a local shopping centre, but nonetheless actually putting infrastructure into the NHS to deliver CT screening. We followed a similar um, way of um, getting people to come. So again, it was GP invitations. Um, this time we had a slightly lower overall uptake of around 40%, but that's not bad because I think the invitations, you know, they said this time that it was for clinical research. 
They said an, a US company was involved. There were many things that might put off some people from have, undergoing their lung health check. Uh, this is the dashboard slide, so it's slightly uh, out of date, but basically I put this up because it really shows the problems of running a major study during a, a pandemic. So you can see from April 2019 when we launched uh, through to April uh, 2020, we really had remarkably good recruitment. So we were recruiting about 80 people per day. We then locked down, uh, so we were stopped. Uh, from recruiting and on reopening, you can see how reticent people were. So our recruitment was way, way down, despite the fact we were inviting the same number of people. So people were basically very scared of coming up to the hospitals. Uh, we were then locked down again, and you could see we had a final push uh, to recruit. So what is the Grail test? Well, the Grail test is a blood biomarker, and it's basically looking for a tumour derived DNA in the blood. So this is called cell free tumour derived DNA. Uh, and we call this a sort of liquid biopsy. Uh, and this is used in lung cancer already. So instead of bio biopsying a tumour, we just take a blood test and we look for different um, uh, mutations actually in, in little pieces of tumour derived DNA in the blood which will tell us about resistance to drugs and things like that. Um, so ctDNA is uh, double stranded, it's about 150 base pairs in length and it comes from actually dead cells. Tumour is growing but it's also dying so the many many cells are undergoing apoptosis within a tumour and they leak their DNA into the blood and it's that that we're detecting. The half-life of this is about 30 minutes so we clear it uh, quite quickly. Now importantly as you would probably guess um, there are a number of factors that influence whether you can detect uh, the tumour DNA in the blood, and that can be the location and more probably most importantly the size of the tumour, and then also the number and sort of size of metastases. So basically the more tumour you have, the more likely you are, are to see uh, ctDNA in the blood and Charlie Swanton, Swanton and Chris Abosh have shown that probably you need a tumour probably uh, two to three centimetres in size before you can regularly pick this up. Uh, this is old data but again it gets that point across that basically we have uh, localised disease detection of localized disease in black versus detection of metastatics, a higher, probably higher volume disease in the check. So what uh, I think Grail and other uh, companies uh, and of course academic labs are interested in is this idea that you might be able to develop a multi-cancer test and this would get over some of the inefficiencies of designing a test for lung cancer, a test for breast cancer, a test for et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the ideal is that it would be a biosample, could be blood, could be breath, uh, could be urine, could be stool. Um, it would be designed to detect many cancers and they would have to be lethal cancers. There's no point in sort of picking up benign cancers. Uh, ideally, it might identify the tissue of origin. So rather than saying, yes, this patient has cancer, it would say, yes, this patient has cancer and there's a high probability it's from the lung. Uh, we'd be able to do a population scale. Uh, and importantly, it needs high specificity. So if you're using it as screening in well people, then you really want to limit false positive results um, because those people are going to be hugely anxious and the doctors are going to get annoyed because they're spending money investigating uh, people that don't have disease. And I think the idea is it would always bolt on to currently recommended screening modalities, mammography, uh, fit, et cetera, for bowel screening. So we, uh, as I've said, are working with Grail, and this is the Grail platform of studies. And I thought I'd put this up to just really show the huge investment and effort that has been put behind this company. So they initially launched with the CCGA study. So that's 15,000 people, seven and a half thousand of whom had cancer. So that's where they've developed and tested their, um, their assays. They then had STRIVE, which is 100,000 women uh, with 
uh, undergoing breast screening in the US. And then Summit was launched, which is 13,000 high risk for cancer uh, people in London. And then recently they've launched their Pathfinder study, which is looking at testing asymptomatic individuals and seeing where positive results take them so that they can map pathways. And this is all, of course, leading to the NHS gallery trial, which is the 140,000 person screening trial being run by Grail and the NHS uh, in the UK in partnership. So the Grail gallery assay, uh, they um, initially tested a number of different assays. They did whole genome sequencing, targeted sequencing, and uh, whole genome by sulfite sequencing. Uh, and I think got really interesting results for all three of those uh, methods, but they've landed on using tar a targeted methylation assay. I think because not only does it detect cancer, but it also gives you a tissue of origin. So again, basically the buildup is you have a tumor, it's, uh, you get tumor DNA in the blood, they then bisulfite, do targeted bisulfite sequencing. And then I imagine there's a lot of uh, intellectual property in this area where they can then map and align uh, methylated fragments to give you a tumor signature. So how does it work? Well, this is the first uh, data from the CCGA substudy two. So this is the, the methylation, targeted methylation study. And what they see is a 76% sensitivity for what they call pre-specified cancers. So they knew there were 12 common cancers that their test worked pretty well in. Uh, it gave a 54% overall sensitivity for more than 50 cancers. You can see the false positive rate is really low, 0.7%. Uh, this is it by stage. So if we um, obviously stage three and four disease in most cancers is probably well, stage four, most cancers probably incurable, stage three difficult. Stage two and stage one in lung at least are curable cancers, potentially curable. You can see stage one, it struggles uh, overall across these pre-specified cancer types. And if we uh, but if we look at the tissue of origin data, this is re really cool, I think. So 96% of the uh, results gave a cancer of origin signal, so name, named an organ, and 93% of those were correct. So, so that's, that's, a, that's pretty helpful as a test. How is it in lung cancer? Well, actually, uh, specificity really good again, so very few uh, false positives. However, sensitivity 71%, pretty good. Uh, but when we look at the stage one disease, so these are, of course, you know, uh, perhaps the Holy Grail, if you'll forgive the pun, 50% uh, uh, in squamous cell cancer, not bad, but very low in adenocarcinoma. And I think adenocarcinoma is proving problematic uh, in this field. So uh, as I've said, they've now uh, launched the uh, NHS gallery trial. So I'll be very interested to see how that goes. The first patients are now recruited. And I think what has been hugely impressive to me is to see how quickly Grail do manage to launch their clinical studies. Uh, there are of course other tests. Uh, so the gallery test is Grail's, there's also CancerSeq. Uh, and Pansia, another test that are undergoing large clinical studies uh, as well. Uh, and as a final slide, really uh, a bit of an advert. So um, the summit study is actually sp uh, sponsored, which means run and guaranteed by University College London. It's funded by Grail. Uh, and what we are doing uh, alongside Grail's um, blood samples is collecting our own blood samples to build a UCL biobank. Uh, we are collecting all the imaging from these patients, so hopefully there should be 25 to 30,000 CT scans. Uh, we are collecting the uh, cancers that are resected and looking at the histology and sequencing those cancers and looking at the health data, both primary and secondary care from a number of sources. Um, so I think hopefully we'll have an amazing legacy for academic and uh, other studies moving forward over time. So a huge thank you. Uh, I won't go through everyone, obviously, but this was the lung screen uptake trial. Uh, Summit is just a huge, a huge trial. There are 70 or 80 people working at any one time on Summit. Uh, and then there's an enormous amount of people that have really worked hard helping me deliver the biological data as well. Uh, the really super important ones uh, for this data I've mentioned on the way through.
so thank you very much and um i'll uh, endeavor to stop sharing the slides thank you brilliant thank you so much for that sam that was a really wonderful presentation so we've got just under 10 minutes for questions or so i was hoping to kick it off the um the idea of what's going to progress and what will regress is really fascinating. Um, so on the one hand, trying to identify those patients, but do you think there's scope for therapeutic interventions? And if so, could you imagine a chemo preventive or given those types of things prophylactically? Yeah, I think, I think so. I think this will be a really interesting area in the future. So the airway lesions, um, are fantastic for a biologist because we can go in and bi biopsy them and look at their biology over time. The ones that are harder to, to biopsy are the ones further out in the lung. So they're often called on CTs, they're called ground glass opacities or small nodules. Very difficult to biopsy. We can't biopsy them over time. Um, but I think from sort of path studies, we will learn more about their biology. Uh, and I think those patients, we, we clinically, we really don't know what to do. So in the Far East, there's a lot of interventions, surgery, ablation, th in things. In the US, they're a bit less aggressive. In the UK, we're very unaggressive. Generally, I'm sure there's differences in areas. Um, but those patients, I think, will be an incredible study of, of prophylactic type therapies, chemopreventative therapies, because you should see a difference in them, certainly, certainly in growth and things like that. So yeah, great, a great opportunity. Amazing. Um, next question related to the liquid biopsy performance, particularly around stage one in lung. So obviously the high specificity is fantastic. As I say, you don't have too many people come through with false positives. Um, it seems like it's still not a solved problem, the early detection in lungs specifically. Um, and kind of going back to the earlier point that you made, just looking at the kind of fundamental biology and Charlie saying that maybe you need a two to three centimeter lesion before you're able to detect. Do you, do you get the sense that this is a fundamental biology problem or is it ultimately going to be tractable with improvements in the technology? Yeah, so so I think the, well, who, who knows, with the technology, I think it's going to be really problematic because we sort of know how much circulating free tumor DNA there is. Yeah. Um, and they've already diluted it down hugely to try and detect these, these sort of bits of tumor DNA whether something a bit less specific you know all of these tests rely on signatures um, and maybe there'll be some signatures that are less specific but you'll probably will decrease the specificity of the test as you increase sensitivity could be that could be a problem um, so yeah i think it's really challenging and 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 therefore you know i think the the game is still up the game is still on um, and for the breath field, for other biomarker fields, absolutely still on, because you you know even the perfect the if I, if I ran the perfect CT screening program in the UK tomorrow, so every smoker between 55 and 77 with a 30 pack year history of cigarettes, if every one of those got scanned, I would only stop about 20 percent of lung cancer deaths. Yeah. Um, because that's just the very highest risk population. But most of the cancers are still in the lower risk population because there's so many more of them. So, so you know, having blood or breath or, or something that we can offer to non-smokers or light smokers, lighter smokers, you know, is, is going to be game changing. And, and Grail, you know, Grail and these other companies are really pushing for that. They've, they've managed to hedge their bets in some ways because they can detect up to 50 different cancers. So it makes it very tricky for health economics to work out. You know, yeah. you can't just do it on lung cancer. You have to do it on the 50, presumably. Um, so, so, yeah, I suppose that's an advantage of their approach. Yeah. Uh, question here from Christian. Are there any differences in metabolic features between progressive and regressive lesions, for instance, in glucose versus oxidative metabolism? Yeah, 
super interesting question. So uh, we've got a new clinical lecturer here who has just done a really wonderful study on metabolomics of fibrotic lung disease. Mm. Um, so of course she she listens to me too and goes, well, no proteomics, no metabolomics, what? Um, so yeah, it's something that we're, we're sort of discussing how about going about um, get, getting into that. I, I think it's going to be quite interesting, actually. Mm. Uh, another question here. What's the cause of the autofluorescence difference in CIS? Is this common to other carcinomas too? Yeah, so it um, basically the, the, the actual the actual reason surprisingly isn't mapped, but there's a, a number of things that probably lead to it. And that's probably in largely the thickness of the epithelium and the vascularity. Um, it is used in the, so nearly everything that happens in the lung is stolen from in, endoscopists that work in the esophagus and stomach. So they, yeah. they, they've been using this 10 years longer and actually they've moved on to new, newer techniques. We're still using autofluorescence bronchoscopy. Um, so yeah, for, for an epithelium, it does work, yeah. Uh, just thinking about breath for a second. So obviously there's different, one can envisage different types of tests, early detection, recurrence monitoring, et cetera. Um, do you think there's value in trying to identify those patients who are truly at risk? Because again, as you mentioned, it's kind of a bit of a broad brushstroke at the moment, you know, age and uh, smoking history. Um, so do you think there's a need to cast the net wider to get those lower risk groups? And wondering if you have any thoughts about whether breath and some of the endogenous compounds of damage uh, may be potential candidates for that type of uh, application, that part of the clinical pathway. Yeah. So, so I must say, I mean, I know you've invited me here today, but I must say, I really do think so. Um, and I think so. Be, I think because of the size issue for early stage lung cancer mm -hmm. for, for blood, that's a re, it's a real issue for blood. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think is it, that breath has an advantage on is that the lung cancers, lung cancers rarely occur in a non-inflamed airway. Mm -hmm. So the majority of lung, 80% of lung cancers are in smokers. Um, lung cancers in non-smokers, probably there'll be some inflammation things there as well. So I think, I think the, um, again, the, the specificity would then be a problem for breath. If it's just picking up inflammation, you'll be swamped. Yeah. But if there is a signature in there that's inflammation plus or minus cancer, yeah. let's give this person a CT. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I really do think that uh, it, there's a great opportunity with that. Mm. 